to take any time from this great group of individuals over here that are going to share uh, a lot of great information. And like she said, just remember, hold all your questions to the end of the program, and the camera will be stopped. So nothing, um, no one it will be identified on the videotaping. The other thing is, I want to take a few minutes and introduce our extinguished guest over here, Edward Harper, who's not paying attention and using his phone. <laughs> He's a licensed clinical social worker. Sorry, Ed, I couldn't this do this. <laughs> He's, he's recently joined the ranks of the retired yes. after what 40 years of working in, yeah. with at um, mental health services at Blunt, Blunt I'm Memorial. Going 40 years. I uh, saw my first person in 1975. Woo! All right. He uh, also served as the director of the Blunt Memorial Senior Services Program. For those that don't know that, um, he. Uh, in that role, he met and helped thousands of families and in our area facing all kinds of challenges, especially those associated with aging. We're glad he's able to be here today. He's got a grand, beautiful granddaughter yes, he that uh, he retired. <laughs> <laughs> so we pulled him away from that. Yes. Thank you, Thank you, Mr. Ed Edward Harper. Sonny, she is a licensed medical social worker with our Blunt Memorial Home Services. And I'm here to tell you, I work with this woman on a daily basis, assisting me with my clients, and she and I assisting her, our office assisting her with her clients with services. And she is a wealth of mental health services experience. Last summer, she moved to Miracle. And prior to that, she worked for several years in Brooklyn, New York, in a psychiatric social work as a psychi psychiatric social worker and substance abuse. She provided counseling, care management, and referrals to other agencies. But she also worked in the mobile crisis management, developed short-term service plans for clients, and she has a depth of experience for our homeless clients and the treatments for resistance clients, as well as a very good knowledge of community resources and how to access those. So we are very blessed to have her in this community. You have no idea how to, just the short time that she's been here, less than a year, what, less than six months? Yeah, about six months. About six months, yeah, we're right at the six month mark. It's, She's my new best friend. <laughs> I wake up sometimes thinking, oh, I need to let her know this, or I need to contact her. Saving the best for last, of course. <laughs> this is Trish Lockard. She is a longtime member and volunteer with the National Alliance on Mental Illness, and she served as our chapter president here in Blount County. She's also a presenter in the classroom. She is instructor for the association's family to family program, and she's going to talk about more about that in detail. But she's also a small business owner and an author. She co-authored a book with Terry Lynn, and they recently published. No, oh, Terry Lyon. Terry Lyon. Sorry, Dr. Dr. Terry excuse Lyon. Dr. Terry Lyon. Excuse me, Terry. And um, it's called "Make a Difference with Mental Health Activism." And sample um, copy in the back. Sample copy in the back, yes, yes. And she has bookmarks as well back there explaining about the, the book. Uh, I want to say a couple of things real quickly that the packets that you have have information in there that focus on exercise, volunteerism, uh, eating healthy, and resources to help you with mental health and family members which you're helping to do with mental health in our community. And with further ado, I will not take any more of your time. Are you all going to sit and present, or do you want to come up here? Come up here. All right, because I was going to bring the mic down. Okay. <laughs> all right. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, everyone. Can you hear me just fine? Okay. Thank you. All right. Yes, I am Trish Lockard, and uh, next month I will be a volunteer with the National Alliance on Mental Illness in Tennessee for a decade. So it's something that I'm very proud of. Um, I have mental illness in my family. I have a mental health diagnosis myself. Uh, as with many families, uh, mental health diagnoses um, run in my family. 
So the first thing that I want to say to clarify, notice in March they have a program on dementia. I've experienced this in interviewing people to attend NAMI's family to family classes, that a lot of people um, think that dementia is a form of mental illness. Dementia is not a type of mental illness. So if that was what you were thinking when you came today, please stay with us because we're going to share a lot of terrific information. The reason that that confusion happens is because, particularly in the early stages, there's a lot of overlap with um, symptoms. Um, confusion, lost words, um, lack of judgment, inability to make reasonable decisions, mood changes, changes in diet and sleeping habits. These can be dementia and they can also be symptoms of different mental illnesses. So it is essential that you get a professional diagnosis of yourself or your loved one to see what is actually going on. And it's important because mental illnesses are treatable. So, and don't assume that things like depression are a natural part of aging. Depression is not a natural part of aging. So, make sure that you get a professional involved in a diagnosis there. Okay. So, this is part of what I teach with the Family to Family program uh, through NAMI, which is an educational program for adults who have adult loved ones with a diagnosis, a mental health diagnosis. So, it's a 30 hour program, I'm not going to do the full 30 hours <laughs> today, but what I want to tell you is this, I want to ask you the question, what is mental illness? And it is an extremely straightforward but deeply misunderstood thing. Every organ in the human body can experience a disorder, a disease, or a dysfunction. And the brain is the most complex organ in the body. It also can experience dysfunctions and disorders and diseases. And the fact is that mental illnesses are disorders of the brain. In the way that our lungs, we can have asthma or COPD. If you have diabetes in your family, that's a uh, that's the pancreas, gallstones as well. There may be heart disease and disorders in your family, arrhythmia, coronary heart disease. In the same way that these things tend to run in families, mental illnesses, disorders of the brain, also tend to run in families. There is a genetic predisposition to all, if not or most, mental illnesses. Brain disorders, and the tricky part is with most disorders of the organs of the body, there's so many things we can do. There are x-rays, there are scans, there's blood work, there's biopsies. These things don't work with mental illness. Mental illnesses affect how people think, feel, and act. And that's what makes them so tricky to properly diagnose and treat. So there's more that I could say about that, but remember, any sympathy and compassion that you would present to someone who themselves has a health diagnosis or a loved one with a serious health diagnosis, please extend that same compassion and understanding to those with mental illness because it is a situation in which someone, through no fault of their own, does not always have control of their thoughts, feelings, and behavior. In NAMI, we call mental illnesses the no casserole illnesses. Because if you have, say, a 20-year-old daughter, it gets a diagnosis of, say, breast cancer. And you tell people, they're immediately sympathetic, 
empathetic, that will show compassion. And maybe church members or neighbors or your garden club or a book club will start showing up at your door with casseroles. It's especially in the South. I'm from, I'm from, I'm from Baltimore. Well, there's not too much casseroles going on there. But especially in the South, that's how people support one another. They show up with food. So you, don't have, you can eat and you don't have to worry about it because you're dealing with this. We call mental illness the no cash casserole illness because if you tell somebody my 20-year-old daughter was just diagnosed with breast cancer or you say my 20-year-old daughter was just diagnosed with schizophrenia, you're going to get a very different reaction unless you're talking to someone extraordinary who understands. They don't understand often, they're frightened, they're confused, they don't know how to react. And the direct reaction to mental illness is stigma. And how many of you feel you know what stigma is? Show of hands. Okay, the, the, about at least half of you, that's terrific. So I'm going to read you the most simple defi a definition of stigma. Stigma is when a society views something as shameful or bad. It is not objective, it is extremely subjective. Stigma leads to bias, and bias leads to discrimination and discriminatory behavior. So individuals with a diagnosis of a, some form of a mental Ill, illness can be discriminated against in school, churches, community organizations, particularly in the workplace. That's not legal. And that's a whole other discussion for us to have. But as a result, stigma is the number one reason given by people for not seeking treatment when they suspect they may have a mental illness. If they have symptoms, stigma is the number one reason that they give for not seeking a diagnosis, for fear of how people will react. And shockingly, the, that's lovely. Thank you. <laughs> the average delay between symptom onset and treatment is, anybody want to guess the number of years delay between the first symptom and when treatment is received? I guess for us it was 16 years. 16, okay. 16. The national average is 11. 11 years on average between the first symptom of a mental illness appears and the person actually starts receiving uh, treatment. And this is not good for a number of reasons. It's a lot of um, undue suffering on everyone's part. Plus, with most mental illnesses, the longer it is untreated, the more difficult it is to treat. So as soon as a symptom appears, you want to jump on that right away. Uh, I can actually wrap up. I think that Sonny is going to cover a few things. In NAMI, we have an expression. Mental health is health. You cannot separate mental health from physical health. They are absolutely intertwined. If you do not have good mental health, you won't have good physical health because it will affect your diet, the amount of exercise you get, your socializing, your friendships, your activities, your hobbies, your life purpose, which are all essential to health, can be negatively affected by mental health. It's taken years, too many years, decades, for the government and for doctors and for insurance companies to come kicking and screaming to the understanding that they need to provide benefits for individuals with behavioral health issues as well as medical health issues. Um, at some point, I'd like to talk about the benefits of volunteering on behalf of people with a mental illness, but the benefits of people with mental illness 
in volunteering. It's good for everybody. So at some point, if we have some time, I will get into that. That's the subject of my book. So um, it's one that's very close to my heart. And um, if I want to take just a second to say, if someone in your home or yourself, if you're having a behavioral health crisis, try not to call 911, which my my panel might disagree with. There is a new three-digit number that works nationally, and that is 988. 988 is the national number for behavioral and mental health crisis situations. If you can't remember that, try to remember this. If you call 911, ask for a CIT trained officer to respond. That's crisis intervention team. Those are officers who have been through training to deal with a mental health crisis, which is a different situation than criminal activity. So 988 or 911 and ask for a CIT officer because this is a behavioral health crisis. And I'm going to wrap with that and turn it over to Sonny and Thank you all for being here on this rainy day. Appreciate it. Well, thank you, Trish. Well, in New York, we said um, you when you call 911, you said you have an EDP patient, so the officer would know what to do because most like how it started in New York, um, the officer will come and will be very harsh with. Uh, um, the person that is going through an episode and we were instructed now as we make our phone call we need to say we have an EDP situation so we know that we will come to help and um, this is very um, um, terrific Trish thank you so much because I would like to start with this story um, because my portion will be about um, early prevention um, coming from New York, um, right now, um, we have free training for whoever wants to, at free of charge, the mayor put there, to assist anyone who would like to know about mental health, so you know the sign. Because we have a lot of trains and buses in New York, um, so we see a lot of things. So what the mayor is trying to do is to try to train us citizens to know how to help these people in distress. So we have what we call in New York the mental health aid, like when you go to know about CPR. So we know how to identify some of the sign of someone that is in distress. And we know what to do now as opposed to move to the next car. So we will not run. We will make sure that we provide the care for this person. So early intervention is really um, something that I will encourage today. Why? Because I have my pastor that have a dear daughter, the only daughter, and she was diagnosed in her late 30s. Um, why? Because she didn't know the sign, and there was no early um, intervention that was done for her daughter. Um, as a result, she had the police at her door every month. That could have been um, prevented if actually she knew what was going on with her daughter. So I make it my job now every time that I can to tell people about early prevention. Know the sign. Um, how can I help when I see this? What does that mean to me? Um, when someone said that I don't want to come outside, I just want to stay in my room. What does that mean when someone said, I'm hearing voices? What does that mean when someone said, I see stuff that you are not seeing? What does that mean when someone said that, I feel like my family will be better off if I'm not here? So sometimes we take those things very lightly. I used to, <laughs> um, because I have a daughter, she's 23. And I thought that, oh, she was just want to stay in her womb. She is not, she's antisocial. This is something also that we use in New York that we I ask people to stop saying antisocial. That's not a likely word. Um, 
because I went to that trainings about hearing voices. They put 10 people in my ears talking at the same time. Mm -hmm. And I was going crazy. I was that, I can't take it anymore. I got it, I got it now. Because when you have, I only have 10 people talking in my ears. Imagine a family member that have hundreds of voices. How do you help that person? So, um, experiencing a mental health challenge can be stressful. Each day is different. And some of them may include overwhelming emotion and thoughts. But it's important to remember that recovery for mental health challenge is possible with the right tools and support system in place. So that's why we are here today. So not seeking treatment can be very harmful. Very harmful. And what I learned in school that when you have a late diagnostic, like when you are in your 30s, deep in your 30s, that is reversible, right? Because um, you get it after what they say that your brain um, is fully um, developed because they said that it's not fully developed after before 25, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so when you get that after and you get the early prevention to help you with your mental illness, I um, study shows that it can be reversible. So that's why we are cons we are going to focus about early intervention today. So lack of treatment may stem from stigma associated with mental health, lack of access to care, or simply not knowing where to go for help. But the longer it takes for someone to receive help, the more difficult the recovery can be. Many people go a long time before developing a mental health challenge and receiving appropriate treatment and support, for example, anxiety, often developed early in childhood and adolescence, and is easily recognized and treated. Left untreated anxiety can lead to the onset of other mental illness and reduce educational and career achievement. So we need to know the sign. We need to give a name to the sign. We need to seek for help. And I understand, like Trish just said about a little bit about treat, about stigma. We cannot focus on stigma. We need help, and we need help right now. So early intervention is important. is an important tool for recovery. And um, there's one more thing about early intervention. Early intervention can also save a person and the loved ones from stress prevent more serious symptoms from developing, and reduce the likelihood of problems with work, family, school, and substance use. Plus, it could help reduce medical costs and the overall burden on friends and family members. Um, in all my years working with um, people with mental illness, one thing that I've noticed is the use of substance use to cope with the mental illness. And uh, at times, we say, which one do we treat first? The mental illness or the substance use? I will tell you, after all these years working, we need to treat both of them at the same time. We cannot start, OK, we, we're going to focus on mental illness and leave substance use on the side. I'll deal with substance use. Afterward, now, I a study shows that when you have a patient that is using substance use to cope with the mental, especially with people with schizophrenia, they use a lot of drugs to help them with hear with the voices, and we have to find a way to treat both of them at the same time. So, how do we do with mental illness and substance use? Mental health problems and substance use disorders sometimes occur together. Um, this is because certain substances can cause people with an addiction to experience one or more symptoms of mental health problems. 
Um, for example, in New York, we are legally, we can use drugs, reads legally in New York. And our young kids are studying very early right now um, because they have access to it. So what we've noticed now with uh, um, our young adults, they become to experience what we call hallucinations that comes from the drugs. And how do we help them? How, what, where to go for the help? Um, so what we are trying to do right now is to educate the parents about those signs when you see them. Seek help right away. Do not think that this is just, um, first of all, this is a conversation that most of the time parents don't want to take to do with you. They don't want to talk about mental illness with you. And they don't want to discuss the sign with you as a counselor. So this is your job. This is my job as a counselor to have the conversation, those very uncomfortable conversations with parents, to let them know that substance use can lead to mental illness, especially when you start taking those drugs at a very early age. And we are at the age right now where um, the kids love the vape out there. And uh, we, we need to start that conversation with them about the vape and where this can lead um, 10 years, 15 years, or 20 years from now. So, we know that more than one in four adults living with serious mental illness problem also has a substance use problem. Substance use problem occur more frequently with certain mental problems including depression, anxiety, schizophrenia, personality disorder. Someone with a mental health problem and substance use disorder must treat both issues. Treatment for both mental health problems and substance use may include rehabilitation, medications, support group, and talk therapy. Some of the most common mental disorders seen in substance use disorder treatment include not only the, the one that I just mentioned, those were the one that we hear more often about depression, anxiety, but we also find it in conduct disorders. We also find it in PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. We also get it in attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. <coughs> and the list goes on. And I'm pretty sure that there are more added to that list because we are now in a crisis. <laughs> So, um, we have to do this thing, and we have to be mindful about this. We cannot let stigma prevent us from getting the help we deserve. And if you need help, contact who you want to contact. If you're not comfortable with mom and dad, maybe the teacher at the school, you are more comfortable with the teacher. Maybe you can talk to the teacher. Maybe you know of an aunt. Maybe you have an uncle, someone that you are more comfortable that will listen. Because most of the time, the parents, we're all the one that don't want to listen. And because we don't want to believe that our little kids can have an onset mental illness. So we have to listen and we have to pay attention. We have to reach out. Um, to someone that we trust that can uh, um, help us with our mental illness. And the internet is so amazing now that it don't take that much to get what actually we need to know. Um, I remember like last week something popped up in my refrigerator and my husband was away. I'm like, what is this red thing is telling me? And I was starting to freak out. And I'm like, what is this? He's, he's all the way to, um, I don't know where he went with his job. And now I'm having this sign from my refrigerator, what to do? And I just Google, I see this sign in my refrigerator, what is it? And I was able to solve that. 
And I feel so proud of myself. And I'm like, if I can use the internet for this, how about more things that are more serious that I need to know about it? So the internet is not as bad as we think it is. Because, yeah, I know that we put so many codes, so many things that we don't want our kids to have access to the internet, but we do can use it um, for our own good. So we do have to actually help them to how to go to the internet and search and have information about the mental health. Um, we have to discuss to our own experience as a um, counselor. I use that a lot. Um, when meeting with uh, with people, telling them about you know the stigma, telling them about you know this is where you can get help, and educate myself on mental health topic, um, get books like a book like Trisha. I'm gonna find out. I'm gonna get a copy because I'm always um, you know go seeking information about mental um, illness and how I can help. And then also one thing that is that is very important that be mindful of our language on how we, we address someone with a mental illness. Um, you are not your illness. Use present first language. For example, instead of saying, I am bipolar, say I have bipolar disorder or I live with bipolar disorder because people don't want to be identified with their illness. And I understand that you don't know, you don't know, but when you know, you do better. <laughs> so we have to start with the change in languages. So how we address people that we know is going through a mental illness. Let people know the language they use affect attitude about mental health. If you notice insensitive media coverage, write to the media outlet. Let them know. If you can find the right person to reach out, you know, to their website, you can always reach out to them on social media. Like, okay, I see the, the headline in your uh, website and this is a very bad way of addressing, you know, mental illness. And people will not want to know about mental illness because of the way that you are portraying that in your website. Uh, we need to be advocate for each other. And uh, while the impact <coughs> of stigma can weigh heavily on many, we can all do our part to help lessen the burden of mental illness in others and ourselves. So hopefully that next time that we're going to talk, so we will change our language on how we address mental illness and we will teach our kids to know the signs so we can do what we call early prevention. Thank you. So since you said that uh, you need to identify yourself, uh, so I am uh, Edward Harper and uh, I have a condition of OMS. Uh, OMS is old man syndrome. <laughs> Ask got it bad. Uh, ask me a question and I'll tell you a story. <laughs> ask me what time it is and I'll tell you how to build a clock. Um, I, I really appreciate the opportunity to be here, and I'm going to make this uh, uh, brief so that we have plenty of question and answer here. Uh, but I will tell you, my head is like a beehive right now. Um, I saw my first patient, um, I was first paid to see a person that way. I was in college and I was a student counselor, so no, it was really practice. I was learning from the person in front of me, practicing, and, and uh, that was 1975. So, uh, I, that was 12 years after the Community Mental Health Act was signed by John Kennedy, the last act that he signed before he was assassinated. So, uh, I'm looking at uh, at, at time frames now, and 10 years seems like a couple of months sometimes. Um, I, I, I see somebody agreeing with me there. Um, so, looking back, because I just concluded a 40 year run with the hospital, Love Memorial Hospital, and working in, um, 
behavioral health, psychiatric services, and with older adults and caregivers there, uh, which is all in the same. Uh, I see some of my colleagues here, it's, it's all the same. We're, we're addressing that. But, um, it, my head's full of bees because I'm going, yeah, we're right back here, and we had such a crisis in 1963 that a president stepped up and signed into law or into act. Uh, and I hit it just when it was full stride, and I worked in Title 20 programs um, back in the 70s, and I started my career in, in uh, medical social work and psychiatrics in 1981, <coughs> um, actually before then. Um, but, um, so when I, I look at resources and how to get help, things move as somebody and some people to find a, a crisis point. We could be operating in crisis points for many years. It's just like you're saying that uh, folks on an individual basis, it's about 11 years between symptomologies, uh, notice, awareness, taking some action on it, and, and then maybe uh, if, if available, uh, care and treatment. Those two are not the same, by the way. Um, and then we want to know where can we go for help, right? Okay. Um, so I've been out of this direct field of care for a little while, and I've, I've been very blessed to be able to um, develop a program that uh, assisted caregivers and older adults and everything that goes around that because not everybody that I saw had a memory issue or dementia issue. Uh, as some of our, our folks have said, they've, they've had family members that, uh, that came to an older point in life that their uh, mental health conditions had been masked by just getting by and survival and lots of other things. So at uh, some point, yes, it looks like dementia, but it really isn't dementia. So you've got that opposite uh, side of the coin for that. And then there were diagnoses of latent life psychosis. I bet there were some psychosis before, say, 68. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I think maybe some people noticed, maybe we could get by with it. Uh, and that's sort of, isn't it? about how we define mental health is psychosis at the extreme ends of, of that spectrum, okay? Um, but isn't there a lot of us that are getting by in the world that might have episodes of anxiety and depression? Um, and those two are not the same. They uh, have been like they're very distinct. They're not exactly the same, but they're you can be anxious and you become depressed over being anxious because you were not depressed. <laughs> and in the first, it was just things were going down a, a slide of you were, or we are, uh, noticing that we can't do something about something and then when we get to feel helpless about it, you know, that's, helplessness is not something we accept right off the bat, right? We fight that a lot and we get helpless with it, then we get to that point of being hopeless. So when are folks looking for a lot of help for themselves? Hopeless. Now, you might do it for your brother or sister when you're feeling helpless or you're seeing their symptomologies. But for ourselves, we really try to, you know, we try to, to, to gal up and guy up and, and and take care of ourselves the best as we can, and we don't know, want really other people to have to bother, be bothered by us. Uh, and then there's that thing you started talking about, the stigma. So, uh, stigma means I can't trust you. Can't be trusted, with all the definition you said, but it means, well, I really can't rely on that person to be consistent. It's another way none of us really are, right? So, I kind of flipped back because I told you I had a wee mess. It's, 
that to go back to where I was started and kind of make a point out of this is that we come together when points of crisis are apparent. Um, so nobody in this room got here by accident, right? I mean, shit, right? <laughs> you don't even see any ducks in this room. <laughs> so, you got here because you have a either personally vested interest in uh, what can I do next. I have a heart condition, so I'm personally invested in what do I need to do about on that. Or that you are an aware person and you're saying, hmm, I need to know more because there's less being done. Or you're professional and you didn't get into your profession by accident either. You came because it was a mission. Uh, so when I'm looking at the, uh, the handout, I, I just kind of first looked at it and went, bam, there it is. And then I went, oh, I helped do this. Oh, I helped do this after some medical director noticed and started keeping track of the number of suicides in this county. We had the highest rate of suicide in the state. And that's the reason it's not just mental health awareness, it's and suicide prevention. Edward, is that what, are you looking at yeah, the resource the packet. list? It's in the packet. Yeah. Yay, but you may not be aware yet, it's in your packet. Yeah, <laughs> so uh, the point on this is it was made at a, in time when there was a crisis identified. And this is probably about the second or third generation of, of these. Any time that you have a resource that's come out and we do a, a good hurrah, it's a moving target. So it's almost going to fade after the ink dries on this. Now here's where I'm going with this, is that part of not finding things is having access to them, right? So if I hand you something and it's got names on here, that this is a paper that's three years old or two years old, it's probably not going to be current, is it? This one isn't. I didn't say this is a bad thing to start with, but it's saying it's not current. <coughs> there are people on here that are older than me. <laughs> no. Yes, they are. <laughs> I know them. They were my mentors. <laughs> And uh, even the Butt Memorial Emotional Health and Recovery Center, that no longer exists. Okay, so part of this is that I told you I'd been out of the loop a little bit. So last night, for about three hours, I went on the internet and on YouTubes as if I needed help. And I started going through how and where to find help in here. And just as some of my doctor friends say that back during the uh, COVID when they were doing telemedicine is that uh, they had more technical problems and software problems in communicating. Because I think telehealth is a good thing. But it was, even though it made access almost immediate with folks and somewhat calculated, there were the software and technical problems with it just as you all were talking up front about the, the access being uh, in the uh, at least the 70s, 80s, and the 90s, more about transportation, how to get there, that kind of thing. So we, we still have that. And the first thing you said to me today was that, are you ready to work with uh, another point of crisis? Yeah, and, and do something that we are you are you ready to get your advocacy on? You use another word, but uh, are you ready to become <laughs> a strong advocate for this again? And, and and that's where the bees in my head are. Is that the answer is yes. I would like to be a very strong advocate, but I need sleep. <laughs> is there somebody else could do it? And and I see that there are. I'm not advocating. 
But what I found out last night was it's hard to navigate even something that's at my fingertips. Mm -hmm. it, it's extremely hard. And it would be extremely hard if I was depressed or if I was in anxiety or panic uh, state. Uh, I mean, that's like the way you're focused, right? Yeah, how long can you focus on something when you're anxious? So what I, I found last night that uh, you could at least find who was current uh, as providers, and let's say agencies, you could find that. And um, when Bolt Memorial closed its, uh, its psychiatric services, and there, there was more financial reason around that than uh, anything else. But, uh, Jerry Wagner, who uh, is in charge of McNabb, uh, said that the 16 beds would not have a big impact on the overall care. Well, I've known Jerry a long time, and, and I agree with that overall in, in the region, it, it, our 16 beds, and that did not mean 16 beds were full, ladies and gentlemen. It's hard to get into care, especially during COVID. But we had uh, uh, 200 beds open up in Knox County. Well, that's a great thing. I went, oh my gosh, you finally were getting some, some care. Well, it's just a little bit hard in this county or another county to get there. So we, we have the access again. We, we do have the services, hooray for us, right? We, we got some services, how to get there. I hope I'm not sounding doom and gloom, but I'm kind of wanting to say, what it would feel like to me last night if I were looking for care and I was thinking, where can I go tomorrow to get it and how to get there? Uh, the other thing that hit me uh, was pricing, price points uh, for private therapists. Uh, and I uh, saw so a lot of 125 an hour and 135 an hour and that's for talking therapists, not, not prescribers. I thought, wow. I don't know if my insurance would pay that. You know, put that on top of already feeling bad. You know, so I think that I've always thought this is that folks who are contending with a brain is not acting right. It's basically is my, my brain's giving me me, me uh, problems. You're they're in a double bind. And there are some of the most heroic people I've ever seen in my life come in for me. I, I'm not just saying that just because I'm trying to blame points. No, I've watched people come in, and you know who the most heroic people I've ever seen in my life that came into my care? Is the people who came back a second or third time. Sometimes the first time is you, you've got to do something. And then you go, well, everything's okay. And then people come back a second or third time. I'm going, please do. Please do. But it's so hard because of the stigma. You think, you know, and that just inhibits access to care. The other thing that has been pointed out, and uh, this is not going to be me telling you where to go. It's going to say that it's, it's going to be hard finding some places to go. Um, even though they're out there and you can find them on the internet, they're, they're listed. Is that when we are sick, we're probably the least capable person of taking care of ourselves. And um, I don't know if I can switch that up, but uh, just raise a hand. How many people are a power of attorney for another person? Just raise your hand. Okay. No. I'm not a power of attorney, I'm a conservator. Okay. I'm going to switch that screen so that we can take a look at one of the things. And I'm going to hurry up because I know we've got some. Okay. Here we go. Um, I think it's the first one. Is it the very first one? I think so. Thank you. Um, that's it. That's it. So I can just scroll that. Is that it? No, that's not it. I didn't think so. This one. This is yes, the one. Yes. Yes. <laughs> okay. 
So, uh, I just saw maybe a quarter of the people raise your hand if you were a power of attorney for someone else. Uh, raise your hand if you have a power of attorney. If somebody's a power of attorney for you. Okay, still it's just a spattering. Uh, what I have found out is that most folks think that this is a very old person's document. No. no. If you're 18 and up, you need to have someone that can speak for you when you can no longer speak for yourself. And that could come suddenly or it could come gradually. Right here is called authorized health care or appointment of health care agent. It is a state form. Uh, I'm going to try to scroll this. If it, yes, it's one page. One page. You, sometimes you'll see a hospital or an agency name kind of printed at the top there. But this is a valid medical power of attorney, which I, Edward Harper, uh, appoint Trish. I ask you, I ask you to do it, and you agree. Yeah. And I ask Julie to be my office. <coughs> she agrees. Okay, you come down, you just put the name, rank, and serial number, and then you get this little line right here, and you print your name there, and then you sign your name right here. And either you sign it in front of a notary public, or you sign it in front of two witnesses. And it's a done deal. I, I printed off 20 of these, and, and it's so unfortunate. I told Julie that I, I, in everything that I piled in at my office, it's, it's in a stack somewhere. <laughs> I meant to get it here, and I thought, ah, uh, you know, no, I didn't get it. But right here, this is where you go. You pull it off. It's called Appointment of Healthcare Agent or Authorized Healthcare Agent, Tennessee. Every state has some form. I like this older form because it's one page. You make multiple copies of this and you take it to every physician's office, every clinic, every hospital. Don't rely on software to know this. I'm not right now working with uh, the drug program at Medicare because they didn't get the papers that I sent them in uh, two, uh, two months ago. Yeah, so it happens, right? This is your life saver. You got kids that are 18, get it. I am still a power of attorney for my daughter who's 35. I just tell her, look, you know, we got it at 18. <laughs> I, I'm a daddy, I'm not going to relinquish this. You're a mother, you're married, you all work this out. Because in the state of Tennessee and many others, you are not a authorized health care agent for your spouse just because you're married. The other thing is that I found out working in a psychiatric unit is that in order to get care, sometimes people don't want the care that's being offered, that they can't tolerate. And you know that they need care, but if they don't come in voluntarily, if they're on that spectrum where they're in, in the uh, more of the psychotic end of it, what's going to happen? they're going to be committed. <coughs> so there is a form of attorney, power of attorney, it's called psychiatric power of attorney. I would advise if you're a caregiver for uh, someone who has had uh, episodes that uh, put them into a very risky situation, either with just general safety or maybe the police or, you know, those kind of interventions that you don't want. And what it says to me is, Trish, I'm asking you to be my power of attorney, or you might come and say, Edward, I can be your power of attorney, but let's just face the reality of your condition. There's going to be times when you don't know how sick you are. Manic people don't know they're manic. That's just the nature of it. That's just the nature of it. Yeah. That, that, that's not being foolish. That's just what that condition is. And depressed people don't know how depressed you get. It's sort of like if what's the difference between damp and moist? And if you Trish told me said, hmm, which one comes first? Um, moist. 
okay, I say, okay, well, you're, you're moist, but how do you know when you're damp? If you're damp, how do you know when you get wet? Now, if you walk out here and you get doused, you know you're doused, <laughs> right? But you, those little incremental stages you don't know because you're living in them. But Trish sees that happening, and she also knows my history. And she can say, I need, I need a, a mechanism where I can have you admitted but not committed. Admitted, not committed. Because now I can go to a bar. Because I could say with this, no, 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 I'm fully in charge. And you say, but we agreed. And this gives me the, the authority as a clinician to admit on Trisha's behalf, or, or you to admit me on Trisha's behalf. And it doesn't mean that Trish is in control of all of my actions. It just means that she is looking after my best interests. And she is the person I ask in my best brain to be that person. The last one I wrote for this was for a friend. I didn't write it, I found it for her, and I said, this is on, and you have to do it. But they're out there, and she was in Georgia, and she had a couple of admissions in her, her life, and she did not trust her husband she was not paranoid, it's just she did not trust her husband to make the best medical decisions for her or her, her children. So she had a friend that was a nurse. Then that's the person she has to be her psychiatric power of attorney. She had a general medical one. I'm running over a little bit. Okay. So, or I'll always do it. Uh, loneliness is the driver here. Any disease makes you, puts you in another position. Even the simple thing is anyone who has diabetes in here turning down a shortcake or a cookie. Right. It takes you out of the general flow and have to explain yourself. Access and cost. They've always been those Points of contention, and that's the reason John Kennedy promoted the Community Mental Health Act. It was disassembled in the 80s uh, with centralization. Maybe we need to go back to something along that line. Now, I was very pleased, and I, I was, did not know this, but in uh, Charlotte, North Carolina, Mecklenburg County, there was a sports figure there who had. Uh, mental health issues and conditions in his family and saw that there was just poor access that the only thing that they could do was go to the emergency room or call 911, which often doesn't end well. And they formed a mental health urgency care clinic. Just like if you don't want to go to the emergency room, you go to an urgent clinic. But they have the uh, first in Mecklenburg County and first of other places, I would say, it's an urgent care clinic for mental health, a walk-in clinic. I went, oh, that's what we did in the 70s. <laughs> We're calling it something a little different, but let's do it again. Let's not say, oh, we, oh, we did that. Yeah, let's make it easier for folks to come in. Not a day program, I mean, we, we need that too. But can't we put this on the same level as a need to add a body? So there's sort of my hope, and if there is a, a challenge in our community, we might want to look at what can we do in our community to make this a walk-in? I don't know where I'm going with this. I made a few notes. I knew last night I was entirely confused. Uh, and about having you know, trying to get care and I thought well one of the things I do want to do is point out the if we can't do it on our own you know let's get help how do we get help how do we make that a legal document okay. uh, so thank you for these few minutes uh, to speak to you and uh, just thank you for being the heroes that you are If it's okay, I want to follow up first of all. I'm happy to uh, take this responsibility.
Thank you so much. <laughs> I want to add very quickly, I have a, uh, I'm going to advocate again for the National Alliance on Mental Illness. We don't have all the answers, and we won't solve all the problems. I do want to point out we have a couple people here today you might want to get to know of, on behalf of what NAMI does, which is education, support, and advocacy. And this segues nicely from Edward, because don't count on people in the government to do the right thing for you. If you're not happy with the mental health services and the facilities and the costs that we are exposed to, do something. Be in touch. I'd like to point out, if I could please, we have a new executive director of NAMI Knoxville. Uh, she is here today. Her name is Lisa DeYoung. Lisa, identify yourself. Hello, so if you have any questions, you can ask her. And we also have with us today Della Moreau, who is in charge of NAMI. It used to be Maryville, now we're calling it Blunt County. Maryville so, Blunt. What? Alcoa, we'll take care of you too. So we have educational programs, we have support groups for both those with a diagnosis and their loved ones, and that's one of the things about NAMI I love. They work equally on behalf of those with mental illness and their loved ones and family members, which kind of differentiates them from some other organizations. They're there for all of you. Mm -hmm.